Hey, welcome back to Phaser Tech. Right here is a low cost mini IPS display that's marketed as a PC sensor panel. But thanks to a Python package available on GitHub, it can be used for other purposes in your own projects as well. Which is how I created this customized clock and weather app that automatically detects your location and updates the weather in real time. Overall, the display works great as a no frills performance monitor and having the ability to customize it for your own projects makes it a great value in my opinion. But recently, the famous tech YouTuber Jay's Two Cents did a review on it, and he came to quite a different conclusion. Let's hear what he had to say about it. It's smaller than an SSD. If I had to make a guess, I'd say it's like a three inch screen. Well, hold on. Yeah, it's about a three inch screen. So the way it interfaces with your system is actually through a USB-C cable. This is probably the only value in my opinion in this entire package now, <laughs> it's just the cable. So don't waste your money with this. Look, I thought this was gonna be like a, at least a five inch screen, honestly. Compared to the size of this, the amount of data they're sticking on there, you would need like binoculars to see it. I have no idea what the resolution of this is. Um, it's like the world's smallest smartphone. Hello? I'd like to order a bigger screen, please. 3.5 inch smart screen. Okay, so it's a little above average. If a piece of software needs admin rights to install, be very concerned, especially when it comes from, there's anime. It's clearly linking via the cable to it. It's like, I have to hit, as you can see here, I have to hit stop. All right, you know what? I think I can stop right here. Um, it's neat, they tried, but I mean, this, first of all, I feel completely duped. Like they actually call, here's the thing, they actually call it a sensor panel. And that's what we called it. Um, um, but you know what, that's on me. I didn't read the info. This is garbage. Um, I, I would recommend, honestly, saving the 40 bucks. By the way, I will link that down below. I'm not gonna link this at all, I'm not gonna link this. So I thought I'd give this a shot. This was a nice try, but we're not gonna waste our money with that, are we? We're gonna buy stuff that we know works. I don't know, whatever. This is, this is, this is garbage, don't buy. Because we got a lot of shit coming this season. Well, that was certainly an informative review. His experience seemed to be a lot different than mine. So who's right? Is this product actually crap? If not, then what was Jay's motive behind smearing this product? Well, I'll leave the speculation for later in the video and instead let's jump into my quick review on it. And then I'll talk a bit about the Python package that you can use to make your own apps, like the one I made right here. Keep in mind, this isn't a fully fledged monitor that can display your Windows desktop. It uses a serial interface and needs an app to drive it. So now let's test it out as a PC performance monitor with the included software. I'll admit the software is kind of janky and not very impressive at first glance. A few parts are written in Chinese and the layout is somewhat confusing, but to be honest it only took me a few minutes to get it properly configured and I had it up and running in no time. Now I'll change the default labels to the CPU and GPU that are in my system. There are several themes you can choose from, some of which are better than others. To be honest, some are downright awful and have confusing layouts that don't make it clear what data they're displaying. But fortunately, there are a few good themes that work extremely well and provide all the data you'd expect from a no frills performance monitor. So let's go with the cyberpunk theme since I know this one works well. Everything looks good, so now we're ready to run it. It actually looks pretty nice. The screen is bright and has a crisp image. Now let's open a game. Let's play Shadow of the Tomb Raider. We can also see the RAM use is going up while it's loading, which is what we'd expect to see. The temperatures appear to be correct as well. And now we're in the game, so I'll just run around and do some random things. Surprisingly, this game was offered as a freebie several months ago on Epic Games, so if you didn't catch it, you definitely missed out. It's an extremely nice looking game that takes advantage of modern GPU hardware. So we'd expect the GPU load to be pretty high on my RX 6700 XT, running at slightly over 1440p resolution. So let's take another look at the performance monitor. As you can see, everything looks right on target. The GPU load is much higher now and the temperatures are going up accordingly. And CPU load is moderate, which is what we'd expect to see. 
So I think it's safe to say it's working as intended. All this data makes perfect sense to me. I'm not really sure what issues Jay was running into, but it was simple enough for me to figure out. Now let's try it with another computer, this time with Linux. You'll need to download the Python library I mentioned earlier, which I'll link in the description. It's called Turing Smart Screen Python. Not only does it give you the performance monitor software for Linux, but it also gives you the library that allows you to integrate the screen into any of your own projects, which opens the door to endless possibilities for it. One thing to note if you're using Linux, be sure to scroll down to the bottom of the GitHub page and click on Troubleshooting. This page has the command you'll need to run in order to grant the serial port permissions for the device. After that, you can run the main.py file from the Turing smart screen package to run the performance monitor. Alright, so now let's fire up another game in Linux. Here's Metro Exodus running surprisingly well on an old 980 Ti graphics card and an Intel Skylake CPU. We'd expect high GPU usage from this game, so let's take a look at the system monitor. And everything looks good, there's nothing really to complain about. But what do you guys think? So now let's move on to the more interesting part of this Python package. Here's where you can integrate it into your own projects. They included a demo program called Simple Program that more or less shows you what functions are available for the screen. You can update the background with an image, update sections of the screen with text, and also update the progress bars. It doesn't offer the most advanced functions and features, but it's more than enough to be useful in many different projects. The library is pretty straightforward and easy to grasp if you have some experience with Python, and it only took me several hours to finish this clock and weather app that automatically detects your location and updates the weather in real time. I created the background images in GIMP and used a few other Python packages to grab the weather data. But the functions I just mentioned were used to send this data to the screen. I uploaded the code to GitHub and the link is in the description, so it's available for anyone who wants to try it out. It might be a nice addition to have on your desk or somewhere else, and it's a perfect fit for a Raspberry Pi as well. And speaking of Raspberry Pi, I've done a few tutorials on them including how to set up a live video stream on your home network using the Raspberry Pi's camera which can be viewed from any connected device in your home. Which gave me an idea. Is it possible to stream live video to the mini display? The Python library includes a function to update the background with an image in PNG format. So I created a program that takes in a live video, converts each frame to a PNG image, and then sends these frames to the screen as a background image. Well, it turns out it does work but it's really slow to update at only 1 or 2 frames per second, which is pretty bad. But it's not terrible depending on what you're doing with it. For example, it should work perfectly fine as a security camera monitor, since you don't need super smooth video for that application. But overall it really wasn't meant to display video, but rather it's meant for applications where only certain parts of the screen are updated at any given moment, not the entire frame. So as you just saw, this screen works perfectly fine and I don't see anything wrong with it, especially considering it's a budget screen that can be bought for around 40 bucks, or even cheaper on AliExpress. But now, let's revisit the question of why Jay would make such a misleading video about it. Well to be honest, it's kind of obvious what he was trying to do. Let's take a look at some more clips. And one of the things that I feel like we've sort of made popular on this channel, we weren't the first to do it, but we definitely were one of the biggest channels to talk about it, and that is sensor panels. I mean, we've done a tutorial on how to set one up. Uh, you know, it's almost like this company's trying to put me out of a job. Clearly, it's not going to get you the granular level of control that we have showed how to use ADA64. They actually call, here's the thing, they actually call it a sensor panel, and that's what we called it. Um, so I thought I'd give this a shot because I was curious as to whether or not this would be an easy one plug solution for people that don't want to go through and have to follow our tutorial on how to set up an ADA64 center panel. By the way, I will link that down below. I'm not going to link this at all. I'm not going to link this. I'm just going to, I'll link the screens. This is garbage um, based off of a trend that 
uh, was getting really popular and I think our video helped make it more popular. So don't waste your money with this. I'll put links to screens down below as well as our guide on how to set up a sensor panel. This was a nice try, but we're not gonna waste our money with that, are we? We're gonna buy stuff that we know works. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I was worried companies that this were gonna put me out of business, but no, they only strengthen the fact of why we are here. Now, I don't want to rag on Jay too much, but this review felt lazy, and he seemed more interested in driving views to his older videos rather than giving consumers an informed and non-biased review. The entire video had a weird tone to it, as if he already decided the product was a ripoff even before opening the box. He was able to get it working after making numerous complaints about minor things. Then after he got it working, he suddenly just gave up as if something went wrong, even though nothing happened. He also criticized its size multiple times despite the fact it was mentioned in the product listing. It seems Jay didn't have the most transparent intentions going into this review. He was concerned that this product would deter people from buying the display that he already made numerous videos about, which would hurt his overall views on YouTube. Now there's nothing wrong with shilling for your own videos. In fact, that's to be expected on YouTube. But that's only as long as you're being honest and genuine with what you're presenting. If you're knowingly lying and making claims that a certain product is crap when it's actually not, then you're effectively running a smearing campaign, which of course is nothing new if you study a bit of history. And yes, I know, in this case we're just talking about a dumb little $40 screen. It's not a big deal. But still, the truth is the truth. And I thought this was a good example to illustrate a point. But Jay's not all that bad. I do agree with him on some topics such as the recent controversies involving Nvidia. And I think he's made a lot of great content on custom water-cooled PCs over the years. But when it comes to things such as product reviews, I feel like reviewers need to hold themselves to a certain standard, and not allow themselves to effectively become a sellout. But anyway, that's my commentary for today. I think the key takeaway is be careful who you trust and who you go to for advice. As far as my channel goes, I put in effort to make sure everything I say is as genuine and accurate as possible. That's not to say I'll never make a mistake. But the important thing is the intention. Personally, I'd like to have a reputation as someone who's reliable and knowledgeable about science and technology that always tries to present the facts. My hope is that people can learn useful knowledge and tangible skills from my videos. So if you value this sort of educational content, then be sure to like the video and subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell to get notified when new videos come out. Also, if you have any questions about the apps I made, then feel free to drop a comment. I'm considering doing a detailed Python tutorial about how I made them, so if you're interested in seeing that, then let me know. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.